Hi, everyone. Uh, so <coughs> about a month ago or so, uh, Children's actually had, if I can say that dirty word here, <laughs> had a conference uh, at UNO on, uh, on outcomes of kids with, who are kind of graduates of our NICUs. And when I was talking to Sherry about what we ought to kind of lead with today, uh, she thought that a lot of the discussion that we had at that time, I'm humming? No, not you. <laughs> mm. A lot of the things that we talked about at that time uh, would be appropriate kind of as a lead off for this. So really we're not going to talk so much about those things that are happening to the neonatal brain during the NICU, but probably more to what the effects of all those things that we do in the nursery or that prematurity or that hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy does to kids. Uh, when they're born early, with a particular focus, which has been really interested, interesting to me over the last 10 years or so, about what about all these really little kids uh, that uh, in the old days we really kind of treated just uh, with palliative care and with compassionate care and just really tried to keep the kids comfortable and the family's happy, or if not happy, at least satisfied with the way we've treated them in the NICU. And one of the things that comes to mind when we kind of talk about this uh, is that the clinics in perinatology, every decade or so, would put out another issue it would be called how small is too small. And I think I remember in the 1980s, they were talking about kids less than 1,500 grams. And then in the 1990s, kids who were less than 1,000 grams. And then in 2000 and beyond, you know, we're 750 and now we're 500. And so what are we doing and how low can we go basically uh, in kind of taking care of these kids and still anticipating or expecting that we're going to have some reasonably or not even reasonably some good functional kids that are fun and that have a real love of life uh, as they survive. And kind of what we found is that there has been a gradual increase uh, in the rate of preterm birth. Kind of an old, a little bit older slide from 2007, uh, the rate of preterm birth rose from 10.7 uh, live births to 12.7 live births. So basically a fairly significant increase over a short period of time. Well, when we look at preterm births, I remember during my fellowship in Cincinnati, uh, everybody at some time or another here kind of worked night shift in the nurseries. I, you know, when you start out, you get to work the weekends and the nights. Sandy, you probably don't remember that because it's a long time ago for you. <laughs> uh, you know, I remember getting called in one South in Cincinnati was the uh, NICU, and I actually remember sitting at the uh, at the desk there, where everybody kind of huddles around with the nursery all around you. And in the old in the old days, for those of us who were around the nurseries in the 70s and the 80s, and probably even the yeah, probably even the 90s, when the NICUs were just these big rooms, every kid didn't have his own sweet like at uh, embassy suites or something like that you had a big room with like 20 or 30 actually the one south that uh, in Cincinnati we had a, it was a 55 bed room basically so it was a big room and so I'm sitting there at about probably 
2 in the morning, and Erwin Light, who's kind of one of my heroes, who was the staff neonatologist there, uh, I'm calling him because I've just gotten a call from a small hospital in rural Kentucky that they had just delivered a 28-weeker who weighed 1,000 grams. What could we do? And I was calling to, to tell Dr. Light that, like a good fellow, I was kind of contacting my attending that uh, we were going out to pick up this baby. And he, very uncharacteristically for, for him, screamed at me, saying, what are you wasting our resources for? For somebody who's 1,000 grams in 28 weeks, you know that this child has no chance of surviving. And this is really a waste of time, money, and you woke me up for nothing, basically. See you in the morning. We've changed a lot since then. That's almost 40, that's about 40 years ago, and that's 1,000 grams. Uh, and today, 1,000 grams uh, is presumed to do pretty well. Uh, if we look at the neonatal mortality rate during these, this kind of same period of time uh, that I'm talking about, uh, in Scotland, uh, deaths from 1989 to 2001, and again, some of this is older data, but you know, I think we can kind of see where it's going. Uh, for kids 24 to 27 weeks, uh, we went from uh, essentially 50% uh, of the kids dying to somewhere around 30% of the kids dying. For this 28 to 31 week uh, group, we went from about 10% dying to maybe 3 or 4% dying. And then the expectation for all kids kind of in the 32 to 36 week range, the kind of more late preterm kids, we just kind of anticipate that they're going to live. So let's kind of try to focus a little bit for a few minutes then on these micropremies or whatever you want to call them. Uh, and this is data from London, from the University College Hospital in London, which kind of looks at outcomes of these micropremies uh, over several epochs. And we see that pretty much for each of the uh, weeks of gestation that they're looking at, 23, 24, and 25 weeks. This isn't really the best graph I've ever seen as far as looking at it, but you can see essentially no survivor survivals in the 23-weekers in the kind of 1981 to 85 epoch to uh, close to 50% or 40 to 50% survival around 2000 for those kids. If we now look, though, at the 25-weekers, uh, they went from about 45% survival during that time to about 85% survival. And I would say that in 2019, pretty much the assumption is generally that 25 weeks is really very, very survivable. That when you get a 25-weeker, show of hands, how many of you would anticipate you know, you're uh, in the NICU again, or for the first time if, you're, if you've never worked in the NICU, and somebody at 25 weeks is admitted and has gotten perinatal care at a good perinatal center, or a great perinatal center like there is here at the Women's Hospital, how many of you would expect that 25-weeker, one way or another, to leave the nursery alive? Most of you? I mean, 25 weeks, yeah. I mean, by and large, I think that when we get, honestly, in my mind, you know, 23, 24 is a lot more, certainly much more questionable. 24 to 25, I think, is yeah, kind of. But I think when we hit a solid 25 weeks, we're to the point where we really are anticipating survival. So if we hit 25 weeks and we're really anticipating survival, what are those risk factors as we're making rounds in the nursery that get us concerned 
for a poor developmental outcome. Well, we've historically talked about three significant risk factors, and we're going to talk about some more as we go through. But certainly the kids with significant congenital anomalies, those kids who in addition to their extreme prematurity have significant perinatal asphyxia or a very difficult delivery, and obviously significant prematurity. And so I think what we're talking about here is really kind of that cusp over which we're really not going to anticipate survival at this point. And I think that we have arguments. I'm on the state child death review team, and we have arguments when we kind of look at some of these extreme preemies about what is non-viable. And is non-viable, well, by, ha by uh, hands already, I think we've said that 25 weeks is certainly not non-viable. I think most of us would probably say 24 weeks is probably not non-viable. Who's seen 24-weekers survive and leave the nursery? So again, we get a lot. We get lots of hands that 24 weeks is viable. I think when we start hitting 23 weeks, and so I think that what we can say is that the kind of 23 weeks is kind of where we're kind of starting to wonder. You know, Japan, though, for those of you who might have seen the literature, I mean, D Japan kind of routinely, you know, will resuscitate and shows pretty good survival statistics for kids at 22 weeks. And so when we look at survival statistics uh, and look at what we're talking about, with development, what's typical development, what's neurotypical development, what's significant neurodevelopmental issues, you know, we can look at those domains, the five, <coughs> excuse me, the five common domains of development, gross motor issues, fine motor issues, language, social, emotional, and cognitive issues. And one of the great things that I think Sherry has done today for this conference is uh, present speaker excluded, kind of put together a great group of people kind of talking about essentially all of these areas of development and what we can be looking at from our graduates. And so when we look at those uh, five domains, what are the associated sequelae that we see and worry about in our survivors. Well, the major sequelae that the literature talks about are cerebral palsy, mental handicap, severe visual handicap, and deafness. And the minor sequelae are speech and language delay, learning disabilities, and behavior problems. One of the issues with most neonatal follow-up programs, ours included, is that what we're going to see in the next several slides uh, is that <coughs> most follow-up clinics and the neonatal follow-up data generally, because of the interests of neonatologists, and as one former neonatologist that can speak, I think, for most neonatologists, don't know a darn thing about development, uh, and really don't have a great interest in long-term development. And the funding for neonatal follow-up is miserable. So that what we find is that most of the, the follow-up literature deals with the major sequelae. Why? Because the major sequelae show up earlier and our major sequelae, which means that they're easier to pick up. Uh, picking up a three-year-old with cerebral palsy uh, and diagnosing it is much easier than trying to determine whether a six or seven-year-old has a learning disability. So that the minor sequelae are minor, 
They're not, they don't slap you in the face when you see them, and they show up later. And so it's really only in the last decade or so <coughs> that a lot of the follow-up literature and a lot of our knowledge about neonatal follow-up and how these kids do has been focusing more on some of these minor sequelae uh, and how they relate to prematurity, HIE, and some of the congenital anomalies. So if we then look at some of these major sequelae, let's look at how frequent they are in some of these extremely low birth weight kids or extreme prematures or micropremies or whatever. So here we have uh, those kids who are around 23 to 25 weeks and the percent of kids surviving, again, at the University College Hospital in London at one year of age. At one year of age, you're going to be able to start really seeing those major sequelae you're really going to have essentially no idea at all about those minor sequelae. And with fairly small ends, between 26 and 51, looking at the different epochs from 1981 to 85 to 96 to 2000, what we see is that somewhere around 25% of the kids will have an impairment leading to a disability. What this means is that their neurologic examination will be abnormal, which is what, how they defined impairment, and that that abnormality will lead to a disability, such as cerebral palsy. Impairment without a disability would be those kids who, for example, have significant hypotonia, which is something that we see quite frequently uh, in the extreme preemies, but that that hypotonia is not significant enough that it's not really impairing function significantly. This kind of difficult slide to see and to read uh, is looking at kids from 18 to 22 months corrected age from 22 to 24 weeks in a study published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And I think that rather than getting flustered that you can't follow everything, I would point you to the upper right-hand corner where we're looking at Epoch 3 from 2008 to 2011. And let's look at all infants. Let's group them together, the 22-weekers, the 23-weekers, and the 24-weekers, and see that those who survive without a neurodevelopmental impairment in that group is around 20%. Those who survive with a neurodevelopmental impairment is about 16%. You with me where we're at? You got that? We're whispering over here. You see where we're at? Okay. <laughs> and those who die is around 64%. So in this group, in this gestational age group, we're losing about two-thirds of the kids. And by and large, I think we can just say of those one-third that survive in this extremely low birth weight group, this micro preemie group, about 50% of them are going to be able to survive without a significant impairment. And so if you're trying to counsel a mom, a dad, a family, where you're starting to deliver around that time, these are some of the kinds of figures that you really need to know to help them understand what they're dealing with. In the Epicure study, uh, which looked at kids in the United Kingdom and Ireland, again, in this very, very micro preemie group uh, of kids uh, born in 1995, and the thing that I like about the Epicure study is what? Well, now, instead of 22 months or 24 months or how they're looking at one year, we now in the Epicure study are looking at survival and assessments at six years of age. So we're really getting to the point where we can start looking at 
10% having severe learning disabilities. Those learning disabilities would not have been picked up, by and large, at a year of age, of two years of age. At two years of age, you might have started to see some language delays, but you're not going to say for a two-year-old, he's got a, learning, a specific learning disorder. By and large, though, for these extreme prematures, for these micropremies here of the survivors at six years of age, what we're seeing is about a 15% incidence of severe disabilities, so significantly less than what we were seeing in the previous study, where it was about a 50% of the kids having significant disabilities. Again, from the same study at six years of age, we see what IQ scores look like for these extreme prematures. I'll go on this side for a change. For these extreme prematures, for these micropremies, what their IQs are. And what you can see is a pretty clear stepwise increase as each week of gestation goes on from 22, 23 weeks to 24 weeks to 25 weeks, remembering that the typical person's IQ is 100, standard deviation is 15, and a score of less than 70 is usually required for a diagnosis of mild if we want to use IQ as an index for intellectual handicap, uh, a IQ of 70 or less is a mild intellectual handicap. So what we're seeing is basically boys delivered at 23 weeks. Average is going to be in that just mild intellectual handicap area, whereas by the time you get up to 25 weeks, the girls with IQs of 90 are really within a single standard deviation and really fit in in the normal population. The other extremely disappointing thing for only me in this room <laughs> is that clearly an extra X chromosome or a Y chromosome, <laughs> an extra X chromosome must be good or having a Y chromosome isn't good because clearly wherever you go, uh, whatever gestational age you have, uh, having a Y chromosome automatically puts you at a disadvantage. Generally, preterm birth is a strong predictor of infant mortality and morbidity and is shown to be significantly associated with a number of poor health outcomes. These outcomes include cerebral palsy, problems with vision and hearing, poor motor skills, asthma, and learning disabilities. And so basically, I think we've seen that. Yes, the lower your gestational age, especially for these micropremies, the greater the risk for significant major sequelae. So the next question that comes up is, are there things for that 24-weeker as he gets admitted to the nursery or as he's discharged from the nursery, which are going to tell me that he is at an increased risk of being one of those either 50% or 15% of kids who are going to have a poor neurodevelopmental outcome? And the answer is yes. If we look at this study from pediatrics back in 2003, what we can see for kids less than 28 weeks, and also in the group from 28 to 32 weeks, is that first of all, the kid, the lo again, the lower the gestational age, the higher the incidence of disability. Well, we're, I think we're all convinced of that, and we didn't need the last ha half hour of my showing you numbers uh, to be 
convinced that kids with lower gestational age have a statistically greater risk of having a poor outcome. But if you detect a brain lesion on ultrasound, your risk of having a poor outcome essentially doubles. So that if you uh, have, if you're delivered at less than 28 weeks, uh, the likelihood of having a disability is 23%, but if you have an abnormal ultrasound, it goes up to 48%. If you're 28 to 32 weeks, 12%, not bad, but brain lesion detected by ultrasound, 22%. Not always real clear what a brain lesion detected by ultrasound is. Uh, and over the years, the quality of ultrasound has improved so much that I believe that the predictive value of ultrasound has really diminished. Because now, the radiologists are picking up all sorts of stuff on ultrasounds in kids who frankly look wonderful. And so it's hard to know what they're talking about. However, these two MRIs, for example, uh, show uh, both of them with uh, ventricular megaly, so big ventricles, though yes, the one on our left uh, has big ventricles. The, ima the amount of white matter, too, and white matter loss is also one of the predictors of poor outcome. And so if you compare the white, which is white matter, on these uh, MRIs to a normal uh, X preterm kid, the amount of white matter here is significantly limited. The one on our right is a little bit more clear, uh, where we have what was a porencephalic cyst in the uh, posterior lateral ventricle seen there, which the porencephalic cyst basically melded into the posterior lateral ventricle. And you get that big outpouching of black, which uh, is clearly abnormal, and then surrounding that, uh, you have a very thin layer of white matter. And so these two kids would be predicted as prematures to have an abnormal neurologic outcome. Another predictor, uh, which I think uh, Barbara Schmidt in pediatrics in 2015 uh, published, which is, I think, uh, easier to look at than arguing about what's a significant abnormal uh, brain scan or MRI or CT scan or ultrasound is that among very low birth weight infants uh, of those who survived to 36 weeks postmenstrual age, the, the greater the number of neonatal morbidities, the greater the probability of poor outcomes. And this really, when you think about it, kind of makes sense. It basically says, if the kid was sicker, his likelihood of doing well is less good. Uh, what is sicker? Well, the major things that she looked at were BPD, and I don't know how she defined BPD. Everybody defines it a little bit differently. Serious brain injury. So here now we have to again look at our MRIs and decide whether or not a grade three hemorrhage, and there's grade three hemorrhages and then there's grade three hemorrhages, uh, and severe retinopathy, for example, requiring intervention, that those three predicted the risk of a late death or survival with disability at five years. And the five year severe disability included motor impairment, cognitive impairment, behavior problems, poor health, blindness, and deafness. So a little bit, uh, if we look at cognitive impairment and behavior problems, we're starting to see even in 
Dr. Schmidt's studies a little bit more emphasis on some of the minor sequelae and not just those major sequelae of intellectual disability, cerebral palsy, blindness, and deafness. We're kind of starting to look at behavior problems and just how much, what are we looking at when we're defining cognitive impairment. Some of the interventions that we do in the nursery also can define a risk as we look at follow-up data for poor neurodevelopmental outcome. I remind people that when, before coming to Omaha in 1990, uh, when I was in Minneapolis, and we used dexamethasone for BPD, who still used the DART protocol? The DART protocol still being used? And then before the DART protocol, we kind of stopped using dexamethasone because before that we used a lot of it. And in the 1980s, uh, to show how smart we were, uh, we knew that the use of Decadron uh, would kind of stabilize the respiratory status of kids with BPD. And in fact, we had 42-day protocols of the use of Decadron. The data came out subsequently that kids who were on longer courses and higher doses of Decadron had an increased incidence of microcephaly and cerebral palsy. I was a late believer in this, and we used a lot of Decadron uh, in our nursery, uh, even here in Omaha, and it's all Sandy's fault. <laughs> right? Because that, those are the times when you were using it. Uh, and uh, what we actually looked at was the number of days on Decadron and what the kids' Baileys looked like. And so the Bailey, this was the Bailey 2. We use the Bailey 3 now, and we'll have a couple of comments about the Bailey 3 in a few minutes. But the Bailey 2 basically had an MDI, or a mental developmental index, and a PDI, a psychomotor developmental index. And the MDI and PDI both had their standardized tests, so mean of 100, standard deviation of 15. And what we found when we looked at days on Decadron and we looked at the kids' Baileys as they got to about 16 months of age was that as the kids', as the kids number of days on Decadron increased, statistically, their Baileys, their MDIs decreased and their PDIs decreased. Uh, and those p-values for the decrease are pretty significant. And so this said, wait a minute, we're not going to do this anymore. And hence, there was that period when decadron was a dirty word in the nursery. What ended up happening is people started looking even at some of this length of time and total dose and the risk-benefit of the use of decadron in the nursery, and hence the DART protocol. You're getting up again a lot. Are we good? <laughs> okay. That led to the question about hydrocortisone. So in the use of hydrocortisone, is hydrocortisone kind of like a mini decadron and we're seeing the same rotten effects or is hydrocortisone more safe? And the nice thing about our data uh, back, and this was probably around 2000 or so, and it really, I think, has been confirmed by all the study, by almost all the studies that I've seen subsequently on the neurodevelopmental effects of hydrocortisone on development, is if you look at that last column of p-values, you see a lot of NSs. And that is basically no hydrocortisone versus hydrocortisone, in uh, comparable populations, and it really does not have, seem to have that same deleterious effect that Decadron does. 
Sherry, you little put a little picture of a baby in there. <laughs> Sherry wanted to change a couple of the sides. <laughs> I like that. Is that somebody we know or not? Yeah. Or is that from just Google or something like that? <laughs> okay. The other thing that we found uh, over the years, and that shouldn't be a surprise, that also I think uh, is not a surprise but important, is that it's not all just about the baby. That the effect of the family and the effect of parents and what they do and how they interact with their babies is really a significant uh, factor in the overall development of the kids. Uh, Grolnick wrote a book on, uh, out, on basically developmental outcomes, and this is kind of one of my favorite quotes from it. It is the co-occurrence of low birth weight and environmental disadvantage that places the low birth weight infant at highest risk for developmental delay. Within high or low risk groups, environmental factors account for the majority of variance in outcome. In between group comparisons, however, an interaction may exist in which environmental factors become less important with increased severity of perinatal status. Certainly for the late preterm kids and for those kids kind of 28 to 32 weeks, I think you can take this slide to the bank. It is very clear that there are factors in the family and in the environment that the kids go into, which by the time the kids are three years of age, unless there is a significant issue in the nursery, a significant grade four hemorrhage, uh, severe episodes of hypoxia, uh, severe ep episodes of hyper hypotension leading to markedly abnormal ultrasounds, that the home environment that the, these kids are in, taking one 30-weeker and comparing them to another 30-weeker, the key thing that's going to define the difference between the two of them when they're five years of age is the home that they've gone into. I'm not 100% sure, and I think the data just isn't there yet, to tell us for those kids 23, 24, 25 weeks how strong these environmental factors end up being in their outcome. And the reason for that is that so many more of these kids have such significant sequelae, medical sequelae, to their prematurity. I think that that question is still out there. I think we can hope that, it's the, that we can make a lot of those same environmental changes and impact their environment and really get the same bang for the buck that we clearly can get in the larger, bigger 28-week preemies. If we are believers in early intervention, and I'm certainly a believer in intervention, uh, we can look at some of those factors which influence a low risk infant's acceptance uh, into early intervention services. The two major predictors uh, that uh, Carrie Miller, who works with us in the follow-up clinic, found, and again, this is, uh, these are low-risk kids. These are the kids who were the late preterm kids. These are the kids with short neonatal stays, the kids who really weren't on, in the old days, ventilators for a long time. Uh, and the two predictors of who's going to get accepted uh, for early intervention services, and I know there's some folks from early intervention that are here, uh, are length of stay. Well, that's kind of okay because that's a nice yardstick for 
significance of the kids' medical problems. But the other thing that we found, that Carrie found, is at the location of residence. So that the same kid living in Broken Bow, Nebraska, if he lived in Lincoln, Nebraska, might or might not get accepted, not based on his medical history, not based on his home environment, but simply where he lives is a significant factor in determining whether or not somebody gets accepted for early intervention. And if you believe that early intervention helps, that has to be really concerning. This slide uh, looks at some of those factors, some of the other factors which we found uh, determine whether or not somebody goes through our whole follow-up clinic. So for those of you who don't know, and if you don't know, shame on you, about our follow-up clinic program here, the TIPS program, we really, for the high-risk kids, uh, or the moderate risk kids, the kids less than 1,500 grams, the kids with HIE and things like that, we see them three times. And we see them when they're about six months corrected age, about 16 months corrected age, and about two years corrected age, and because we're kind of behind at children's, it's probably more like 10 months corrected age, about 21 months corrected age, and sometime before they start high school, basically. <laughs> and Look, and that program is funded by the state. Uh, this for the state is one of the state's major child find programs, helping to pick those kids who are going to be at significant risk for verification for early intervention services. And what we found, and, this, and so it doesn't cost a nickel, basically, for the family. But initially when we looked at this, what we found is, unfortunately, ethnicity was the significant predictor of whether or not the kids would complete all three visits to uh, the follow-up clinic. And so we have to look at what are those barriers in the healthcare system that prevent families from going to follow-up clinics, which are paid for and most people would agree, have a significant beneficial effect in helping to uh, identify those kids who are at greatest risk for needing early intervention services. And certainly there's some good literature that Amy and Janice could talk about, some good literature kind of talking about the benefits of early intervention. Uh, when Holly Roberts, who's going to be talking here later today, kind of looked at this data in more difficult, in more, in more, looked at it more closely, uh, she really found that ethnicity ended up really being a proxy uh, for young moms with significantly high-risk kids. And so if we look at who is not going to follow up in our clinic, it's going to usually be the non-Caucasian young mom with a sick kid. And I think that for those of us in clinic, Paige is sitting back there shaking her head, those are the kids that don't, that don't show up, basically, in clinic. And so we have to figure out a way, if we believe in early intervention, to get these kids to come to clinic so that we can still help provide for them those services which we believe can ameliorate their, dif their disabilities. Well, it's not only coming to clinic. Uh, one of the things that uh, all of us dealing with kids in the NICU and follow-up uh, have been looking at more lately and the general pediatricians really kind of took the lead with this, and it was only a little bit later that the NICUs really picked it up, 
is that we know that maternal depression also affects kids' outcome. Those kids where moms are depressed uh, have, don't hear as many words during the first couple of years of life, and there is a very clear correlation uh, with lower cognitive testing and maternal depression. Uh, and so all of the NICUs in the region now you know, have gotten into screening for maternal depression in their kids. Here was our data from maternal depression of children with congenital heart disease. And in looking over most of the data of late, uh, what we're finding, I think, is that uh, one of the fourth year medical students actually looked at screening for maternal depression in moms of kids who had pediatric surgeries uh, in the NICU. Uh, here, uh, Maddie Galis, uh, who's a just finishing some graduate work at Loyola, uh, helped us look at maternal depression uh, in mothers of children with congenital heart disease. What we're, find, what we're seeming to find, for at least our population anyway, is that high scores on the Edinburgh, scores of usually greater than 10, and the Edinburgh is what pretty much all the NICUs are using here and what we're using in follow-up, really is not so much related to a particular NICU condition like the need for pediatric surgery or congenital heart disease, what it seems to be related to as much as having a kid in the NICU. And so we really need to help support these families and these moms, uh, not only for the mom's sake, but also for the kid's sake. Talked about a difference between Broken Bow, Nebraska uh, and Lincoln, Nebraska. This is another study that we did, that I did with in the Society for Developmental Behavioral Pediatrics that we're trying to look at ways where we might basically be able to standardize some nationally, at least some of the testing that we use and some of the criteria that are used for early intervention. And what we did is we picked five states where we had the data available and we looked at Bailey scores, okay, and uh, looked at five kids, basically, at various ages from 18 months to 26 months, looked at their Baileys and said, okay, uh, if you lived in one of these 10 states, uh, one of these 12 states, would you qualify for services or not? Uh, if you lived in Alabama, you would qualify in four of the five states. If you lived in Arizona, you wouldn't qualify for any of those states. You wouldn't qualify in any of the states. Uh, if you lived in uh, Idaho, you would qualify in three of the states. So there's a tremendous variability from state to state, from region to region, from county to county about whether or not you're going to qualify for early intervention services. And these disparities are just frankly not acceptable. So what have we looked at? Well, what we've looked at is that there's prenatal factors, genetic factors, chromosomal factors, congenital anomalies, perinatal factors like hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, cerebral hemorrhage, uh, infections and postnatal issues like medical complications and environmental factors, the neglect that can take place due to maternal depression, which all affect the central nervous system. And those effects on the central nervous system can lead to some of these severe sequelae, cerebral palsy, intellectual disabilities, and autism, or minor things that will show up later but are also significant factors for the developing child. Uh, discoordination, learning disabilities, ADHD, they're all present in higher incidence in kids who graduate from the NICU. And what it does then is it leads to this cycle of disadvantage and disability starting with, if, start anywhere you want, 
on this, but you get a newborn infant with significant uh, risk factors. Those risk factors are going to increase the likelihood of developmental delay, which are going to increase the risk on the family, which are going to cause worse outcomes. Those worse outcomes are going to then further uh, predict poor outcome for the family, for the child, cause worse self-worth, worse perception of self-worth with subsequent pregnancies, repeating the cycle over and over again. Josephine Baker uh, was a public health worker who helped establish some of the first programs in preventive medicine and public health. And to curb the enormous death rates in New York City, she used school nurses in the summer of 1908 to visit the homes of newborns to teach mothers how to care for their babies. There were 1,200 fewer deaths that summer than the previous one. Some what seem like relatively small interventions can really have very, very significant impact. And so we go back to idea. Individuals with uh, Disabilities Education Act, uh, which established, among other things, IEPs and IFSPs for kids 3 to 21 and 0 to 3, our obligation to refer kids of concern for an MDT, realizing a lot of the risk factors that we've talked about. This is concerning. This is a kid with significant ventricular megaly. Here's what he looks like early on. We can all see the significant head lag that's there. And although this kid has poor trunk control and uh, in a some asymmetry in his exam as he reaches for his toes, standing with a great deal of support by 18 months, he looked pretty darn good. Those three little dots in the right center of this is cystic paraventricular leukomalacia. Anybody, I don't know how much many of you can see that. Those three little guys up there, two with three. That's cystic paraventricular leukomalacia, which most of the data would have us say is a very, very good predictor of subsequent significant motor disabilities. And yes, this child has significant motor disabilities, as you can see from the scissoring the toes pointed down, the hands being fisted, uh, the strabismus. Here she is again with uh, tight hamstrings, the C curve of her back, continued fisting. This is a grade four hemorrhage uh, on your right. That big white splotch is intracerebral blood. And this is what that child looked like uh, after he died. As we're just about finishing up, I want to get to a couple of the slides that in 2019 uh, I think are among the most important. And the reason for that is that I think it helps us think about the family and the kid and what's really important. The National Center for Medical Rehabilitation Research and Disability Classification Terminology, which I like better than the World Health Organization's, talks about path pathophysiology. So if you've been napping, please wake up for like three minutes so that you can see these couple of slides. Pathophysiology, which is the interruption of normal physiology. Impairment, which is the loss of normal function. Functional limitation, restriction of ability to perform functional activities, disability, restricted participation in societal roles, and societal limitations, external barriers to full participation. Well, if we look at that major sequelae of cerebral palsy, what does this mean? The pathophysiology is cystic PVL. The impairment is spasticity or contractures. 
The functional limitation is awkward walking and difficulty dressing. The disability is the education in a restricted environment, limited sports access, and the societal limitation is exclusion from school, medical treatment, and insurance. In talking to parents of kids who have cystic PVL and cerebral palsy, I usually don't hear them say, boy, I wish you could fix the contractures. You know, what we usually hear them say is he has such difficulty getting around in school, I wish we could do something about that. And so I think the arrows go both ways as far as where we go, whether we deal with the pathophysiology, the impairment, the functional limitation, the disability or the societal limitation. But I think what we have to do is we have to consider what's important for the parent, what's important more than the parent though, what's important for the kid to have a good life, to be able to go to West Roads with his friends and get along and go shopping and have fun. And frankly, if he doesn't care whether it's in a wheelchair or whether or not it's with a walker, then I really don't care either that much. I mean, I can kind of make him a little, you know, I can cut down his contractures a little bit with some Botox or something like that, but our goal needs to be for the kids to allow them to have a much more functional, happy existence and not think like a bunch of health professionals uh, like, boy, I need to fix that cystic paraventricular leukomalacia because it's not going to happen. So there are ways that we can classify like the uh, gross motor function uh, classification scale for motor skills. We can use the gold standard Bailey, uh, which frankly for those of us who use it, we're not real impressed with because it overscores virtually everybody. In 2008, a premie cost, at, cost the country $26 billion or about $50,000 per premie. And a recent article in pediatrics in 2019 looking at outcomes of premature kids basically found a couple of things that are not at all surprising that really wrap up everything I've said so far. And that is that the overall prognosis for survival of kids born at 22 to 27 weeks gestation increases as their gestational age increases. And guess what? If you don't get transferred to the NICU, you even have a lower chance of surviving and if you do get transferred to the NICU, so compassionate care in the nurse in the delivery room pretty much is going to guarantee that you're not going to survive. Having said that, at 23 weeks, even intensive care in the NICU isn't a good predictor of survival. If we look at the overall risk of no moderate to severe or severe neurodevelopmental impairment, among these survivors, again, no surprise. The lower the gestational age, the less likely you are to have no impairment if you survive. And if you do survive, the more likely you are to have a severe impairment. Kind of what we've said over the last hour, but it kind of is, I think, what we all thought when we started. So that if we kind of put all this together, what is the chance of survival without any impairment for live born infants? At 27 weeks, it's about 65%, but at 22 weeks, it's about 1%. And so we have a really significant change in that 22 to 27 week period. So I think one of the ways to finish what we're thinking about is we need to kind of get in there and really support those perinatologists so that we don't get 22-weekers and we get at least 27-weekers.
And sorry, I went a little bit over, Sherry, but we're good. Questions? Okay.